Well, she's getting our presentation going. Uh, thanks, Hope and Mike, both uh, very uh, good projects that are well underway, even with the hurdles they've been, that have been thrown at them. And I think these are the types of projects we'll see much more of in the future with the regulatory and legal reform that we're hearing from the administration these days. Uh, so typically what I get asked when I stand up is, what is a dredging contractor doing in a room? And mostly this case is because I'm a friend of Norm Anderson's. Um, but uh, dredgers are part of the process, and after you guys spend years designing, planning, financing, somebody gets to have the fun part and actually get to build the projects, and that's what we do. Um, so uh, Great Lakes, let me tell you a little bit about the company, but I'm going to skip through a lot of the background slides on who the company is. There's a couple other points I'd like to make, and hopefully uh, uh, if we have, I don't think we'll have time for questions, but we're all going to be around the rest of the day, so feel free to uh, uh, track us down. So just real quick about Great Lakes. Uh, we're a 126-year-old company. We are based in Chicago. Uh, got our start building the downtown shoreline in Chicago. So if you're, when, you, when you go visit there, you can admire some of our old work there. Uh, we actually built most of the maritime infrastructure in the Great Lakes uh, in, our early, in the early years, about 1900 is about the time frame we went around in New York and Boston. Uh, we actually are the largest dredging company in the U.S. by a factor of two, uh, three depending on the, on the year. And uh, so uh, we don't do a lot of work in the Great Lakes anymore. Most of our work is major port deepening, coastal work, uh, maintenance dredging. Uh, we actually have 25% uh, of our work is international, uh, mostly in the Middle East. Um, and 75% uh, of our work is domestic, and most of that is for the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, who I will say is actually our best client no matter where we work in the world. Uh, you'll have a little different view this afternoon about the Corps and maybe something a little different than others here, but in our, in our world, the contracting side, they're actually quite effective at what they do. Uh, just the type of projects we do, you know, the capital, the coastal protection, maintenance work, uh, we do some international uh, uh, rivers and lakes, we actually do some reservoir dredging and that type of thing with our smaller, smaller units. Uh, we own uh, 35 dredges, uh, most of them based in the U.S. Uh, we are a Jones Act company, so the work in uh, the vessels in the U.S. are, are uh, U.S. owned, U.S. built, and U.S. crewed. Uh, we have one of almost every type of dredge. Uh, being an older company, we, we've done a lot of different types of projects. We're pretty proud of our engineering team. And if we have a challenging project, uh, we actually do have some fun uh, developing new equipment. Uh, this is... Uh, it's one of our big uh, barges. We talk about from the future growth opportunities we see as a company, but more just where the market's heading. Uh, obviously, the deepening of U.S. ports. We talk about the Panama expansion. Uh, let's not forget the Suez Canal expansion, which also is a, uh, a big uh, impact on the marketplace. We, we're doing a lot of work these days on the coastal side, Louisiana. Uh, Sandy work has, has been uh, uh, you know, big uh, supplemental appropriations. Uh, for doing work that should have been done before Sandy, uh, before Katrina. Uh, so we're hoping for a new emphasis on the coast there as well. Uh, the water, water bills are extremely important to us, and uh, we're tickled pink that uh, the Congress has got back on track with the two-year WERDA process. It's very important for all of us making investments. It's important for the port authorities to make their investments, be able to plan for them, important for private companies to be able to look at it as an opportunity uh, for their work. And for us, it's an opportunity to try to forecast because our equipment has a 30 to 40 to 50 year life. And if we're trying to guess what's going to happen on a seven year word of process, uh, try and explain that to the owners, right? Uh, obviously, a lot of port deepening talk. Uh, there's a lot of projects that have come out of word of 2014 and 2016. Um, a lot of uh, uh, talk, again, about uh, the Panama, but it's also just about port expansion uh, in general. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, some of the things I've learned to uh, move to D.C. about four years ago. And, and how do you talk about infrastructure? How do you talk about dredging? How do you get people interested in what we do? Typically, uh, you talk to somebody about dredging in about 30 seconds, if that long, their eyes glaze over. You know, what are you talking about? Yeah, you, you're excited about it, but what's that got to do with me? But if we talk, start talking about rail and highway and air, uh, other infrastructure modes, all of a sudden, we have a larger group to talk to. And we all kind of do fit together in discussion. So I would argue that uh, in, in terms of uh, infrastructure discussion, maybe we ought to throw supply chain discussions into that, uh, 
discussion as well. Because not only are we just talking about builders and contractors, you're talking about folks whose supplies, whose products are on those modes of transportation. You're talking about, well, we've done some work with supply chain folks, and if you ask them, what do you prefer, air, water, highway, rail? And their answer is yes. And it's kind of a cute comment response, but you start thinking about it, it's exactly right. Because not only does it drive their decisions on how they move their products, but it also drives innovation, right? It drives the next generation of transportation. Uh, when I talk to university students these days, I, I challenge them. Containers are my generation. I started my career in Los Angeles. We deep in New Harbor in 1979. It was not for containers, it was for coal. The coal and the container expansion did not take place until the mid 80s. So if you put things in that time frame, what's the next generation gonna come up with that makes containers a thing of the past? We still wanna dredge deeper for container ships for right now, but uh, let, let the next guys come up with something. So we've got all these report cards and things we try to refer to infrastructure. Uh, ASC has a report card, it's often referred to. It's kind of a downer, right? Negative, and we go up to, deep, up to a D plus maybe, uh, $4 trillion worth of investment needed. How do you solve that? It's almost something that it's hard to get your arms around. Uh, there's, there's a Bush uh, school, George Bush school down in Dallas that actually has come up with a supply chain report card. And it turns out that the US is the leading supply chain country on their scorecard. Now, it's only a B plus. Room for improvement, right? It's always what you tell your kids. You can always do better. But the point is, is that when it talks about getting products to the marketplace, we're pretty darn good at what we do. Even with our hands tied behind our back, we find ways to make it. And maybe it's a combination of the modes of transportation. Maybe it's one or the other. Maybe we need to improve one or all of them together. But that conversation needs to take place as, as a uh, uh, comprehensively, not, not uh, exclusively. Uh, AAPA has their freight initiative, American Association of Port Authorities. I have some slides on that. I'll whisk through those. You can look them up later. But basically, they, they call for a, a significant investment, not just on the water side, but also on the land side. Again, as Hope and Mike have talked about, you get the products into the port, you got to get them to the market. Uh, American Shore and Beach Preservation Association talks about coastal investment, needing $10 billion over uh, the next 10 years to protect our coast. So we don't have... $60 billion disaster bills that come up out of nowhere. Those are, uh, not all of it's preventable, but a lot of it, the damage is preventable. And then finally, where does the innovation come from? You start talking about containers, you start, start talking about new, um, uh, new modes of transportation. And when you start talking about, and we hear a lot, people want to talk about a national freight plan, a national port plan. And I think we have to be a little cautious because my conversations Anything with national on one end and plan on the other, I don't care what's in the middle, it ain't going to be good. So we need to be careful about how we restrict planning in the future, re restrict innovation as we develop these, these thought processes. Uh, and as infrastructure advocates, you know, all in the room here, we have to make the case, we really don't care if the investment is federal, state, or private, right? It's got to get done. That's our point. As engineers, we need to make the case that, that this, this infrastructure is important. Do we really care if the feds pay for it? Well, a lot of the projects are federal. They are a federal responsibility. They should pay for it. How's that working for you? So as we talk to governors, the message has been, okay, guys, these are your projects in your states, ports particularly, uh, the, for the work we do. Uh, and they'll complain about the federal investment. Again, how's that working for you? So we've seen a lot of movement on, on the state side. Uh, governors have really stepped up to the plate. Uh, starting with uh, Rick Scott in Florida, who wrote the check for the Miami deepening that we did uh, several years ago. Wasn't going to wait around 20 years for the money to come. He was going to take care of it. Governor Deal stepped up to the plate and has funded the work we've been doing so far in Savannah. Uh, Charleston, Governor Haley, set aside the money three years ago to do that deepening. They're just waiting for the approvals to get started. And right now we've got, uh, there's, uh, last count, there was eight states with state level initiatives to fund port and coastal work. So it's yes, it's a federal responsibility, but governors are stepping up to the plate. And certainly with all the talk about P3s, uh, private investment, alternative investment, whatever you want to call it, uh, those are all very interesting and, and, and something we need to take a hard look at 
And there are some opportunities out there. Uh, some of them are maybe going to be next generation. There are some opportunities out there today, and we need to look at the legal framework to make those uh, more attractive. Uh, real quickly, just the freight movement side. This is the slide that APA puts out, and it's, it just really shows the different modes and how everything gets moving. Uh, I'm not going to go through the details on their, uh, on this is their request to Congress and the administration. Uh, if you want to get things moving, uh, this is an investment that ports need. And now can I talk about something that's near and dear to our heart, it's steel and horsepower. Uh, it's our new dredge. So uh, Mr. Hoagland this morning talked about uh, his new barge, uh, the ATB, if you were there for that early presentation. Well, we're actually building an articulated tug and barge new dredge. $156 million investment uh, in a marketplace that actually is quite difficult to understand. Uh, the President's budget goes down every year. Uh, again, try to explain that to the banks. Um, it, could, should be coming, it will be coming online this year. And uh, it's actually a little different than the normal ATB because Mr. Hoagland's vessel will load on one port and discharge on another. So when it's transiting, it's a fixed unit. Our work is all offshore. So that means it's a very dynamic system. So we're going to be loading the barge while the tug's holding the, uh, the barge in place. And then we're going to be transiting to an offloading place, again in the ocean, and the barge is going to be coming up again. So a lot of dynamics involved with very cool engineering discussion. You will talk about some more later. I'd be glad to do that. And um, can we get to, we're going to hopefully show you a, a little video here of the, of the launch of the vessel back in uh, November. Again, U.S. built in a Panama City, uh, Florida shipyard. And this is just the barge unit itself. The tug's being built separately. The tug itself is seven stories tall. This is an important day for Great Lakes, we but also important for the like. U.S. economy and the safety and can the security of the U.S. Later? investment. Uh, we have to have a competitor building a upper dredge also. It's about uh, two-thirds the size. Uh, you'll see it in the background. Between those two vessels, we'll increase the hopper dredge capacity in the United States by 35% just with those two investments. And no, we did not pay for those seagulls to fly by. <laughs> See the other vessel in the background there. That by itself is a hundred million dollar investment as well. So. They're very complicated machines. Every inch on there has some working part, as opposed to a regular ship, which just might just be some steel plating and hold to, to carry stuff. Everything on a dredge actually works for some purpose. So uh, I'll go ahead and conclude with that. Uh, I want to show one, oh, one more slide there. Uh, thank you. Well done. Uh, uh, our byline is that it all starts with dredging. If you start to think about that during the day as you start talking about port development, uh, uh, getting your uh, products on the shelves at the Walmart uh, and things you buy, uh, they came through a port. And it, doesn't happen unless it gets dredged. But one of the other things we do is coastal restoration. Congressman Graves hopefully can make it this afternoon. Uh, these are types of, when he was uh, head of coastal protection uh, agency in Louisiana, uh, this was one of the projects we did for him, Schofield Island. This is building barrier islands uh, in Louisiana. So he's had a lot of success with that. And uh, we'd like to remind him of uh, some of the work we've done for him over the years. So anyway, thanks again for host allowing our panel to speak. I think we have uh, aviation folks coming up next. Okay, so thank you again. We will be around this afternoon.